I'm going to probably assume that they're not going to have one of the longer essays on this. However, you can assume it's going to be FAQ, and obviously it's definitely going to be multiple choice. But we'll practice it either way. So, westward migration. So, in terms of westward migration, if you think about all the stuff that we think about, we start our westward migration following the Civil War. Civil War is basically a cause or a historical context for westward migration during the Gilded Age. So remember, all these veterans have money now. They have all this money now that they're going to be able to go and move westward, and they want to be able to expand. So in order to be able to expand, they expand west, and they're going to go into all the western lands, Utah, Oregon, and things like that. Now, the big one that's going to happen that kickstarts all this is what is known as the Homestead Act. Okay? Now, the Homestead Act was in 1965. And, well, 1865, yes. And what's going to happen is that they're going to say that you're going to get 100 acres of land per family as long as you farm it for a certain amount of time, then you get to keep the land. Most of Utah, Idaho, Nevada, all of those are homestead states. So more than likely, if you have family that moved over here in the late 1800s, they had land from the Homestead Act. Now, this massively allowed people to migrate west. This is where you get, like, the Sooners, the people who left too soon. Or you get the Great Plains, where people are going to come into conflict with the Native Americans. So if you think about our timeline, we start with, like, you could even do a historical context of the gold rush and westward migration in the 1850. You could also do a historical context or cause with the Civil War. And then you go into Homestead Act, the movement west, and then that causes conflict with the Native Americans. Now, Plains Indian tribes are going to be the ones they are going to conflict with the most. That's the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, the Cherokee, all those in the Great Plains, think like North Dakota, South Dakota, South Dakota, are going to be the Great Plains Indians that we're going to fight with during the Indian Wars. Yes? What's the difference between Carlisle boarding schools and Indian boarding schools? The same thing. Indian boarding schools is like the more common phrase. Carlisle, there were several Indian boarding schools, but Carlisle is the most famous out of all of them. So they're the exact same term, but just two different, two different ways, basically. Uh, so the Indian Wars. Causes of the Indian Wars is easy. It's conflict because of westward migration. Uh, so this is going to be where we come into conflict with those settler or those Native Americans because we find on their land gold and we take their houses. And remember, all the Homestead Act took away land from the Indian or the Indian reservations in order to be able to do that. So the Indian Wars is caused by this westward migration conflict. Now, additionally, Dawes Severity Act. That's going to be the one that's going to reduce the size of reservations and make the modern-day reservation system. So this massively restricts the amount of land that people are going to have. It also further allows you to be able to go to the Indian boarding schools, which remember where they're going to take those and do assimilation, which is going to make them have white culture or make them go in and have um, white ways rather than native ways. It was a way to be able to strip Native Americans of their culture. Yes. Wait, the Dawes Act... Um the Dawes Act restricted the Native Americans' land. So basically, it made them into strict reservation systems, and those reservation systems would therefore be the strict boundaries of the Native Americans. Is that the same thing as grants peace policy? No. Grants peace policy is going to be prior to this, and grants peace policy was the idea that basically we are going to put them onto reservation systems. It was worded more as pro-Native American, like, oh, we're going to put you on these reservation systems in order to be able to protect you from others and therefore cause peace. But the Dawes Act, I like to think of severity as severe, as in it's going to be severe against them. It's going to heavily restrict them. Okay? Um, okay, technology and industry in the Gilded Age. So this gets into also the second industrial revolution. So Gilded Age, remember, is the idea that we're gilded is basically saying that outside it's bright, it's shiny, it's gold, but inside it's corrupt and awful. So basically, this time period seems like we're wealthy and we're prosperous, but inside it's really just corrupt. And that gives us the difference between the robber barons and the captains of industry. Now remember, robber barons are going to be the ones that are going to be those, those corrupt people. They're just out there to make money. So most common examples are things like Vanderbilt 
Rockefeller, Carnegie, Ford, those are all examples of those industrialists. Now, we talked about in my class how you can classify them as either captains of industry or robber barons. So you have the option. You just must defend that in an essay. So if you want to say that Henry Ford is a captain of industry, isn't a good guy, because he expanded the workday, gave people a living wage, then that's great. Do that in your essay. But if you want to say he was a robber baron because he ordered troops on his labor unions and also was a Nazi, then you can do that too. It's however you want to swing your essay. But all these count as terms. So remember, when you talk about defining and explaining terms, all of these can be included. Um, in terms of the general industrialists, the most important two to know is going to be Rockefeller and Carnegie. Now, Rockefeller and Carnegie, the reason you need to know him, you must know the difference between vertical and horizontal integration. That's the most common comparison that they're going to do. So remember, horizontal or vertical integration is you own every single part of the business. You're going to own, if you own an IHOP, you own the business, the people who make the milk, the people who make the cartons that put that milk is put into, you own the chickens that make the eggs, you own every single part of the business. That is a Carnegie, okay, Carnegie Steel. On the other side, or Standard Oil, Standard Oil, Horiz or horizontal or vertical, in horizontal integration is gonna be every single part, hi Sam, hi. Horizontal is gonna be that they own every single part of one part of the business, but not every single part of the business. Monopoly? What? Monopoly from that area. Rockefeller got monopoly on the oil. He was the, like, basically the owner. Yeah, so he was the, well, so all these are examples of monopolies. Yeah. So Rockefeller's monopoly is that he owned every single part of the oil business. So he owned the canisters that you put the oil in. He owned the scientists who create the oil uh, recipes. He owned the oil refineries. He owned every single part. Carnegie, on the other hand, did not own every part of steel, but he owned every single steel mill. It's all the way around. Sorry. Sorry. Realize that literally 10 minutes ago, I realized I had this review session. Sorry. So, oil, he owned every single part, so Rockefeller. Okay, let's just start this over. I was right, and then somebody said I was wrong, and so I switched it. So Rockefeller is going to be the one that's going to be the vertical integration. So he's going, or horizontal. So he's going to be the one that owns every single oil refinery, but he doesn't own all parts of the business. Carnegie is the one that's vertical. Sorry. You can see what happens when I go get tacos and I don't go prepare for things. Okay. Anyway, so the other thing that you need to know about these two is that these two are the most commonly referenced uh, possible captains of industry. Carnegie, you will also see for Gospel of Wealth, okay? So Carnegie is also going to be your Gospel of Wealth guy. So if, remember, he's a progressive. It's the idea that if you're wealthy, you must give charity. Are we okay? Sorry, I did the same thing yesterday with the 13th and 14th of them. Yeah? Um, what exactly is uh, progressivism exactly? Because, like, I know the basic definition, but I'm not super used to So remember, progressivism is literally progressing in society. So it's change. So progressive era is all about changing things. Changing things for the better in society. So it's things like making living conditions better, wages better, <laughs> making it uh, easier for immigrants. It's all about progressing through life. Yeah, trespassing is another example. Yeah. So like at the same time, there was like current features because like progressive society, you have to expand. Was that completely separate from progressivism? I would put Turner thesis more into westward expansion and imperialism. Because basically it said that it's God's duty to move west. It did say that the west was closed. There was no more area in America, which is why we began to be imperialistic. Is because we couldn't fulfill the Turner's thesis because it's closed. So we began to move into imperialism and colonization. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, immigration. We are talking about the uh, these two right here. Panic of 1873, remember, that kind of shows our over-reliance on the monopolies. So remember, we had a monopoly of the banking industry. Everybody put their money into singular banks. But then when the banks closed and they fell, everybody lost all their money. So Panic of 1873 is kind of like a cursor saying, okay, clearly we have a problem where we cannot rely on a single monopoly. But obviously we did, and it caused a bunch of other problems. Uh, second Industrial Revolution we talked about. Okay, in terms of immigration, so Angel Island is Asian, 
Ellis Island is European. Easiest thing. Remember we did it? Yep, we did that in class. Angel Island, Asia, Ellis Island, Europe. Europe. Good. I'm glad you remember that. That great time before we had the robot. Okay. Anyways, so push-pull factors during this time are going to be very similar to the ones before. Remember, the second wave of immigration is going to focus on Eastern Europeans. Those are the pogroms. Those are the anti-Jewish uh, anti attacks. mobs, attacks, yeah, uh, in Eastern Europe. Yeah. So this is, I just clarified, this is Jewish people being pushed by the pogroms and the anti-Jewish attacks. Yeah, basically over in Eastern Europe. So you're thinking like Russia, Ukraine. <laughs> People who were Jewish were how they discriminated against, and they would do a pogrom where they would go in and basically purge cities. They would place them in their yes, exactly. Do you think we'll have to differentiate between the Panic of 1857 and the Panic of 1857? No. If the Panic of 1857 is put on the AP exam, there's going to be some. It's probably going to be. So on the AP exam, there's 55 multiple choice. Five of them are specifically made to be almost impossible to answer because it tests the validity of the test, and then they throw them out. And that would probably be one of those questions. That's a very, very hard one. Okay? Yeah, it's because they have to make sure there's no cheating. So they make questions specifically to make it so you, it's almost impossible to answer. And then those questions, if you get them right, they're bonus points for you. And they get thrown out for everybody else. That's why it's never out of a perfect 55. Yeah. Nope. And some? No. Um... Okay, listen. So, no, they don't tell you which ones are which. Um, however, if you don't know this, there are four versions of the test. Only three of them are available in the United States. One's an international version. Out of the three, a school can have all three. So, also plus an alternative version. So, last year, there were several schools that multiple schools had all three tests in their same schools. So certain tests have more of those harder questions than others. Ooh. It depends on oh. the situation. Every, every year they say the alternative one is harder, which is called, um, it's called, it's called Form M. And they say that that one's the hardest one. Other people say that the regular DBQ and stuff is the hardest one, but they all have different questions, different essays, and different DBQs. Yeah. They get thrown out, but they count as your bonus points. Yeah, but it's, I mean, if you get them right, then good on you. They're specifically made to be very hard questions. Well, you just guess. Yeah, you guess. 25% shot. Okay, anyways. Um, so altogether, reasons why we have all these people come in are going to be because they're being pushed out of their own environments because of a lot of these Jewish attacks. Additionally, we have Eastern European we also have, uh, you have a lot of Asian immigrants as well for the exact same reason as they've been in the past, especially towards the late 1800s when we start to have civil wars. Um, you're most likely to be asked about Eastern European. We also have a lot of our traditionals like Irish, Italian, uh, those come in as well. Italian is why we get the Red Scare, by the way. It's a great continuity in American history is we're fair communism. And we were fearful that these Italians were coming in and being communists and anarchists. So... Part of that comes to this time period. Anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish, you can also use that in a World War II essay as well. Sacco and Vanzetti, yep, 1920s, great example of discrimination against Italians. Okay, in terms of last one, and then we'll do like a little practice essay pre-write. So uh, last one is going to be the growth of cities. So upper, middle, lower class, you have to know the difference between the three of them, especially in the progressive and the gilded age. Because you need to know there's questions that have been LEQs that have said, what is the impact on social classes during this time? Or whatever it could possibly be. So uh, Little Italy, Chinatown, and Third Ward, those are all of the um, immigrant areas. So high poverty. You also have the tenements there, which remember are where all the poor immigrants are going to go because they can't make a living wage. Melting pot is the idea that all these cultures come together. Originally, it was a derogatory term as in a negative thing. Nowadays, melting pot is more seen as a positive. Consumerism can be anywhere from 1870 all the way up until like 1970s. But it's the idea that we're going to start to buy more wants rather than needs because we have more money, especially our new oil tycoons and things like that. Uh, conscious consumption, the idea that you're going to spend money just to show that you have the wealth. 
And then sweatshops are going to be attached to this immigration as well. All right, so let's do a practice essay. So grab out a piece of paper or a half sheet if you want to share. <laughs> the essay. So, evaluate the extent to which westward expansion and industrialism were different between 1865 and 1920. What type of essay is this? It's a comparison essay, which means one side of your T-chart should be compare, so similarities and contrast, which is differences. Okay? So, go ahead and pre-write your essay. So, brainstorm your pre-write. Remember to look at the time period and know what happens between those times. You're comparing the difference between basically two parts of the Gilded Age. Part one of westward expansion and part two, industrialism. So they won't say that. So we're just right now. Right now you're just doing a pre write So this should be done within the next three to four minutes. Remember to do PSC, by the way, that will help you on your T-charts, help you brainstorm. PSC, political, social, economic. It used to be that that's how all AP essays were written because that was the format of the AP exam with the rewrite. This is a great brainstorming because then when you're sitting there like, I don't remember a single thing about industrialism. it will be like, oh, wait, economic, oh, robber barons, and whatever. It's a brainstorming technique. Remember, minimum of three on each side. If you don't have a minimum on three, we just learned a bunch of terms. So I hope you can add them. There's also several things we didn't talk about that you can add. They can be like non terms, but then within your points, you have the term. Like if the point yes, is. Yes, but remember that one essay that we did where everyone put racism? Right. And then nobody said yeah. any specifics. But like, say it was like a point was on. How, I don't know. Like, like, if it was about racism, like about immigrants and stuff, could it just be like that? Like, within you talk about it? Yes. But 
normally I like to write those specific cases okay. on right your teacher. Yeah, that makes sense. Remember, by the way, if you know one of the terms really well and you know a bunch of subterms, like immigration is a great way. And if you know like a bajillion terms associated with immigration, you could write a whole flipping essay really on immigration on this and you would get all the points. That's what benefits you. That's why you'll see that on your practice exam if you are taking it. Once you finish your T-chart, underneath your T-chart, I want you to write down, if you were to do historical context on this essay, what term or event would you use as your context? So your contextualization, something happened before that caused the now. That's what I want you to focus on. Now, in a comparison essay, you only have to do one of the time periods. But in theory, if you're finding similarities, you can probably find some sort of a continuation that happened prior. There's some really big ones. Like on the topic I just talked about, there's a big one right before that time period that might influence. So just write down your topic that you would have done for your historical context. Remember, specific topic. Take about one more minute. Technically, yes. Technically, contextualization can actually be after the time period, but it must immediately follow it. So if you were to take this and say one or past this time period, the immigration affected the Red Scare in the 19th or whatever it could be. Well, you could do Red Scare. But no, but that's what an example I was giving. But yes. Okay, yeah, Zach. When can you do the second type? Technically, you can do them in both. I encourage you to try to do the first type only because that's what you have to do on a DBQ. So on a DBQ, you're required to do type one. Yeah. And the reason why is because all your hip analysis must be type one. So I encourage you to do type one. But in theory, you know enough now that it could help you unless you get like, a DBQ on like the first grade awakening and you're like, I don't remember anything about the first grade awakening. Then you start being like, also at this time period, the revolutionary war occurred. Some like that. Okay. So in terms of this, similarities that you can be able to find between the two. Gen uh, yeah. Okay, so Go ahead. Okay, good. So government's involvement. Yeah. Good, expanded opportunities for minority groups. Great. What about some differences? There should be a ton. Yeah. Migration. Okay. Migration differences. So you can put one is west or white westward migration, and the other is migration in. So migration out, migration in. Good. Yeah. Yeah, technically you could do it between that time period. As long as you were going to say imperialism has to do with industrialization, which you could do if you talk about like sugarcane plantations. Yeah. Uh, migration is urban versus rural. Yeah, exactly. That's like the most basic one, right? What about historical context? What are some things that happened before to cause the now? The Civil War ended, which opened up the Western Territory. Perfect. So Civil War. So you talk all about the Civil War and then say these veterans then moved on and did blah, 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 blah. Okay, good. Any more? So wait, so like our, our historical context, should we say like the end of the Civil War opened up the West? And that's well, called a transition like, sentence, and then you immediately go into your thesis. Is that all we need to talk about? Or we well, you do need to expand. No, because you just have to say moving in. So you'll be good there. Okay. Don't forget, practice exam in here tomorrow, 8 a.m. I'm bringing donuts. Make it all worth it. Make it all worth it.